Well, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Chris Lim. I'm the executive director with the Contra Costa Resource Conservation District. Uh, I just would like to start off by acknowledging that I'm currently on land taken from Karkin and Bay Miwok Indigenous Peoples. And I strive to continue in their traditions of sustainability, stewardship, and living in harmony with nature. And especially in light of today's verdict, um, I hope our country has turned a corner and the verdict is just the first step on a just pathway. So with that, um, again, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, we have a full week long slate of activities and webinars for folks. Uh, and this is actually our first one. Um, thank you so much to Douglas Kent and Cheryl Miller for joining us and um, um, agreeing to speak with all of you tonight. Um, and just very quickly, if folks are not familiar with resource conservation districts, uh, we are a non-regulatory special district of the state. Um, our mission is to conserve the natural resources of Contra Costa County. And we do that in various ways, uh, whether that's working with teachers and classrooms or watershed groups or creek groups uh, or agencies or other nonprofits or farmers and ranchers. Um, you know, all of these folks helping to amplify um, and serve our mission. And this is really exciting um, tonight because it's sort of a, uh, a kickoff in our wildfire work. And it's something that uh, the RCD Contra Costa hasn't really been able to do, um, but because of some current funding, uh, we're able to serve our communities uh, with these events, but also uh, work in broader ways um, to help with wildfire especially considering its connection to climate change and its uh, timeliness and having it be on folks' minds, especially in California. Um, so with that, I will pass it to Hannah. Thanks, Chris. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Hannah Lopez, and I work at both Alameda and Contra Costa RCDs as a wildfire specialist. I'm currently speaking to you all from Ohlone Lands. Um, tonight's webinar is in support, like Chris said, of our Earth Week activities, and it's also supporting the Wildfire Community Preparedness Day, which is a national campaign that encourages people and orgs everywhere to come together and raise awareness to reduce wildfire risks. Again, thank you all so much for being here. I also want to thank everyone who made this webinar possible, from our speakers to the RCD staff who put it all together. I also want to acknowledge and thank our funders at the California State Coastal Conservancy, the California Natural Resources Agency, and the California Department of Conservation. Um, next slide, please. No. All right. Um, yeah, just please know that this webinar is being recorded and it's going to be made available to you all in the future. If you do have any questions, please use that Q&A box um, to put them in for our panelists and put all your comments in the chat. Um, if you do want to comment to read to the entire audience, please make sure you send it to all panelists and attendees. Um, and yeah, we are super fortunate today to have some great speakers with us today. Uh, we're going to hear from Douglas Kent from Cal Poly Pomona, Cheryl Miller from the Diablo Fire Safe Council, and Igor Skerdoff and Ms. Anik from Contra Costa Resource Conservation District. Uh, so I'll introduce our first speaker. Douglas Kent is the author of the best-selling book on property protection in the United States, which is called Firescaping. He's been working to create fire-protected communities since 1993 and has worked in high-risk communities throughout the state. He has also been on the front line of many wildfires. He is the author of six other horticultural books, over 50 articles, and has helped lead four statewide education campaigns. He has taught land management courses at California Polytech uh, University, Pomona, since 2008. He holds two master's degrees, one in regenerative studies and another in landscape architecture, both from Cal Poly Pomona. He lived in the Bay Area for nine years and has worked with East Bay Mud and throughout Costa, Contra Costa County since 2006. Tonight, he's gonna to be covering the essentials of home site protection. So thank you so much, Doug, please take it away. Thank you, Hannah. Um, I love the ritual of acknowledgement. That is a fantastic way to start. And in that, I would like to acknowledge everybody here. 
Um, these presentations are dynamic and attract a wonderful individual, somebody who's engaged, open-minded, and actually has a physical impact on their property and the properties around them. So I would like to acknowledge the unique person that showed up today. You know, there's hundreds of thousands in Contra Costa and Alameda counties, and yet only six really is a self-selecting. So thank you so much. And I'm really honored to be with people somewhat like myself, action-oriented, open-minded, and grateful. So thank you for having me. This is a quick presentation. Um, only about 36 slides and only about 40 minutes, and it just covers the essentials. So I have three slides on the crisis, just highlights the problem, really well known, and then the rest of the time I, I cover the care. What can we really do in fire country to get around this corner and have a sustainable relationship with our land for the next hundreds? The picture that I showed on that cover slide is the Witch Fire in 2007, and it's kind of an important fire. Arnold Governor, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger um, had had enough of fires, devastating fire in 2003, fires in 2003, 2005, and then 2007 came the Witch Fire and other fires, and he had had enough, and he completely revamped the building code, boosted Cal Fire's budget, and off we went. He was going to eradicate this problem professionals, fire ecologists, people like Cheryl and I know the worst is still ahead. Fire tornadoes, fire weather, and extreme fire conditions are going to be the norm and the, the, the are well known. The two primary reasons, the two primary reasons is a warming state and a warming planet. And then the other reason is more people in fire country. We have more assets, more infrastructure, more stuff in the path of fire. We have 40 million people in state, 25% of those, 10 million people live with the threat of losing their home. This is a huge deal in California. The reason I show that picture of the witch fire and Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger's actions for that fire is that this is a list of the 20 worst fires in California based on structure loss. All the ones highlighted in orange have happened after 2007, after the governor threw down the gauntlet and said no more. We've experienced 14 of the state's 20 worst, seven of the top 10, three of the top five, and the top two have all occurred. In the last five years alone, we have set records across the globe as far as destruction goes. Things are not getting better. And I'm just gonna back up really quick and just real briefly show a historical overview of, of fire in our state. Native California Indians lived with fire. This, they used fire for a variety of reasons, to hunt, to make traveling easier. Sometimes fire was started by accident. Live with fire. There was no one to put it out and it would have been a constant companion. All the early explorers document this too. Cabrillo, Drake, Richard Henry Dana say that the landscape was ablaze and always smoky, not blazing like big flames, but just always smoky and smoldering. In the 1700s, the Padres came in the friars and built the mission districts. And their concept of fire was, and land management was completely different. They avoided fire. They let the world burn around them and just existed in their, in their own little island. This paid off. Not one mission was ever lost to a wildfire. 1800s, the Great Gold Rush, the Western Migration, and the Dust Bowl all led to a mass migration into the state. And everybody came in, they saw everything on our landscape as a commodity. The timber, the minerals, the water, the land, the soil was all valuable. And fire was seen as a threat to that. And suppression started in earnest in the 1800s. Smoky Bear was conjured and, and propelled across the United States. And suppression exists today, but we are evolving. And we really need to create a new ethic that will take us into the next 100 and 200 years. How do we live alongside a force that is as natural as a king tide in California, something that has roamed our state for tens of thousands of years? 
I believe we can live alongside fire, and we have a lot of examples to prove. What I'm going to be talking about is just the bare, bare essentials. This is the care portion. I'm going to be talking about emergency access. Let's enable fleeing and fighting. I'll be talking briefly about structures, small properties, defensible space, plants, and then a rousing three-slide conclusion. Cheryl and I will be taking questions at the very end, so save it after I finish, and we'll definitely get to your questions, I hope. Our job is to enable you to live alongside fire. So the very first thing is emergency access. If I drive to anybody's house, this is the very first thing I'm keyed in um, and, and looking at and analyzing. And the reason being is the majority of lives are lost on roads in a conflagration. Sometimes we're given minutes from not much time and whole towns have to empty out. These roads have to be able to handle the fleeing vehicles and then the incoming emergency personnel. Because of the densification of California, some of our roads were built in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and then we get more occupants per structure, and then the cars that accompany the more occupants, roads that were originally designed as two lane or one lane now because of all the people parking and, and stuff. Roads are our first responsibility. Some of the key characteristics. Now, I know Contra Costa actually has really good roads. Alameda has some really rough potches, but Contra Costa is a newer community and your roads are fairly solid. But some of the key characteristics, just so you know, is proper width, off street parking to allow that fleeing and that fighting, rollable curbs. So emergency personnel can roll up and down those curbs to make quick turns and get out of there. You wanna make sure signage is visible. We've seen the images on TV. Most of these fires are fought at night because that's when the Santa Ana's really kick up. That's when the pressure differential is so great and visibility plummets. We need signs that are really big and addresses that are really bright. Vegetation is cleared 10 feet on either side of the road. So we can't really start a fire from the road and overhanging branches are managed in such a way to calm drivers and soothe drivers, but not transmit a fire over that vital artery and shutting it down. Driveways. Um, I've gotten to do several um, drive-alongs with firemen. And in an emergency, they may send one engine down a street and this one fire engine is responsible for picking one property to stand and defend and hopefully help defend the neighbor's house. And the driveways is where they get that information on whether your property is defensible or not, whether or not you provide a sanctuary and value the firefighters' lives. This is a buddy of mine in the Sierras in Rough and Ready where the 49er fire had destroyed the towns of Rough and Ready and Grass Valley and Auburn decades ago. He values emergency personnel and has created a driveway that will attract those, those emergency personnel in. He has multiple places for the fire engines to turn around. Importantly, you can see the structure from the street. So the firemen know, fire personnel know exactly what they're driving into. They can see paths around the structure so that they can see that they can safely navigate the property. There's no flammable vegetation along the driveway and the driveway itself is more than eight feet, 10 feet in some places. These are the key characteristics. The driveway is a bulletin board to the emergency personnel that you care about their lives and you want to be protected. Driveway is And then pass around after fire from paradise to tubs to even the tunnel fire in the Oakland Berkeley Hills that sometimes you just cannot flee by car. You're going to have to flee by foot. And all firefighting is done by foot, or a lot of it. Good pathways around your property are essential. You want to make sure that they're at least four foot wide and stable, not really mulched, but more like dirt or DG, something that you can kind of jog on. You want to put a small cross slope so water doesn't pool and get mossy and mildewy and slippery. Always make sure that there's handrails on steps because emergency personnel may be lugging. Make sure there's good forward visibility that you can always see 15 feet in front of you so you're not running into danger. These are the characteristics of a good pathway around a property. 
So these are some of the things that we can do for emergency access, whether you're a homeowner or renter, rich or poor, there are things that we can all do along our roads and pathways. One, remove the dead, dying and diseased vegetation. That is the stuff that's gonna start in a firebrand attack. Clean vegetation from 10 feet on either side of the road, three or side of your footpaths. Make your address visible. This is so important all year long. Create off-street parking, in, in maintain an inviting driveway, and then manage a safe system of paths. I moved back down to Southern California in the year 2000. Since then, this hillside right here, this is the foothills of the Santa Ana Mountains, has gone up twice. This 1970s development, which is really a fire hazard with those windows and, and poor siding, survived both fires in large part because of the road. Great width, off-street parking, overhanging branches have been managed, no dead, or ignitable material right along the street, this road helps save a vulnerable homes. Next thing, so we've taken care of emergency access. We can get off the property and emergency personnel can get in. The next most important thing to do is handle your structure. Fire brands are more likely to inflame your structure than direct flame contact. This is a picture of the Wolseley fire. This is one of the city council members of the Malibu and he sent me these photos just aghast. He's sitting there protecting his home. There's no fire in this canyon at all. The fire, the, this was a Santa Ana condition. The fire was behind the hill. Fire brands were pushed up over the hill into its valley. And those fire brands ignited the most flammable objects, which just happened to be two homes and two of his neighbors. Notice the landscapes, not even a blaze. Take care, please, of your structure first. This is the number one thing we can do. And here's just a great example. This was the bonfire, in December of 2020, just again in the Santa Ana foothills. These are the whole hill was producing flames up to 15 feet long. And those flames were only 10 feet from that house. And yet it survived. We can do the same thing in, in fire country. And I'm not gonna belabor um, um, structures too much because I'm more of a hort guy, horticulturalist, but I would like to point out that Californians actually had architecture wild, wired in the 1700s. As I mentioned, not one mission was ever lost to a wildfire. And you can see that in their architecture. Small windows, adobe siding, overhangs on the structure that are not big and catch the firebrands in heat, non-flammable roofing material. And the area outside of their lands, outside of their buildings would have been all use. It would have been food, livestock, tanning, milling, and, and, uh, and, all kinds of other work. It would have been really non-flammable. We've already know what to do. We've known it. We just need to get back to some of those core principles. Small properties. This is really the Achilles heel of California. From the top left, the tunnel fire of Oakland, Berkeley. The bottom left, the campfire in paradise the Tubbs fire in Santa Rosa in the top right. This is the old fire in San Bernardino 2003. What happens in a small lot is that when one house goes, they all fall like dominoes. Small, a house will burn at about 1100 degrees and that radiant heat will be so great that it can easily ignite its neighbor. You can see in the picture in the old fire, this really wasn't a land fire, a landscape fire, or a wild this is a structure fire. And the same with paradise. If you've ever been up there, that forest is intact. This was a human fire. This was a structure fire. And the fire just took the most flammable things on the landscape. So here's some things we can all do on small lot properties. One and most important is put a non-flammable barrier in between the two lots and in, in between the two houses to try to prevent that radiant heat from being transmitted from the burning house to your house. I know they're more expensive, 
But the neat thing about it is that they're better at sound protection, they're better at visual protection, and they can really help save your house. Two, make multiple ways off your property. Negotiate with your neighbors and create gates in between properties. Not everybody's going to be able to flee with a car. You need to create multiple ways off your property. Number three, and if you can do it, get off street parking. Small lot properties are prone to having streets that are lined with cars, and not all those cars are going to get moved in an emergency. Creating off street parking can allow that two way traffic in times of emergency. Try to share vegetation. That's really important. Not everybody needs a huge tree. And not everybody needs to plant their side of the fence to create these massive walls of vegetation. Also, you want the most fire resistant and fire retarding plants if possible. And lastly, pools are not a bad idea. They're water in the system and they become available at any emergency. So whether it's a fire, a disruption in power and water or an earthquake, it becomes a vital asset during times and the whole community can benefit from it. So don't feel guilty if you have a pool. It can be a real asset and in times of emergency. I don't know if you remember in the Santa Rosa fire, the Tubbs fire, that one couple spent the entire night in their pool and survived a fire while their neighborhood burnt down. So here's something that we can all do on our structure. So if you're rich or poor, homeowner or renter, and the reason I keep on bringing up renters is that California has the second lowest rate of home ownership in the nation. And it was a lot of renters that took the brunt of the paradise and the tubs fire will and a lot of the other fires. And so we really need to acknowledge that their role in fire country. So anybody can do these along and outside of your structure. Ensure all openings are closed. Get up to the roof and physically push those screens to make sure they're not rusted through and that they're in good shape. Manage the weatherization around all your doors. A common source of ignition, believe it or not, is through the garage door. Garage doors get really bendy and wavy over time and they leave gaps in the, in the weatherization and, and firebrands can actually get through these gaps and ignite anything inside your garage. It's not uncommon for a, a house to go down from a fire that started from the inside and burnt it out. Check your openings. Clean the roof, especially the gutter. The gutter is a vulnerable, vulnerable place. If you get a fire in the roof gutter, that fire can get transmitted up the rafter, across the beam, or down the post. It is really essential that we keep our roof and gutters as clean as possible during fire season, which is like nine months of the year now. LA had a fire today, took out a house. Manage the seams and fill the gaps. What you're doing when managing the gaps is you're preventing those firebrands from being able to stick to your structure. Wood buildings can survive a firestorm. If there's nothing for those firebrands to stick to, you have a good chance of survival. So the picture down below here, if this was my property, I take a power washer, spray it off, let it dry, quickly sand it, fill those seams with silicone or putty, and then slap a quick coat of paint on it <laughs> and that might be enough to protect it from the fire brands and then lastly make your address visible again this is so important to emergency personnel all year long okay the first five feet only two slides here but this is critical the first five feet plays a disproportional role in your home's survival and here's the reason why if you get a fire a bush that's on fire that's producing two foot flames, that radiant heat goes out in every direction and those flames go out in every direction. If you put a vertical surface next to that heat, what happens is that heat builds up and actually gets hotter. And all of a sudden you get this convective process that just screams up the vertical surface. And as that airflow, that hot air rapidly rises, it takes the flames with it. So a two foot flame can easily be elongated to five to six feet. Those flames can now reach the trim around windows, penetrate openings like um, laundry vents. It gravely endangers your home. 
I was doing an analysis for a city in Southern California, extra high fire hazard area. Everything was getting rated super great. And you can see it in this structure. Wonderful roof, impeccable siding, double paned windows, great access. Look at this wonderful access around the structure for the emergency person to rush. And the only thing was lazy just <laughs> chucking the stuff right outside the house and renters and homeowners everybody is really prone to this but it gravely gravely endangers the structure so within the first five feet avoid storage no recyclables no trash no toy boxes no tools all that goes inside or further into the landscape absolutely no flammable plants no juniper cypress um, any conifers or rosemary, any super fragrant shrub, we really want to keep it supple and moist if you're going to throw anything in there. No woody or dry mulches, absolutely none. If you're going to use mulches, use inorganic, pea gravel, river rock, DG. Not use organic, then it would be humus, the most decomposed and wet and moisture. It has moisture. Avoid the use of fabrics if you can, just avoid it. Awnings, umbrellas, seat cushions all add risk. During fire weather and fire season, bring those materials indoors. And then lastly, just to, um, if you can, avoid erecting shade devices. Um, shading devices are seriously prone um, to ignition because they're built of soft wood. And, um, and I have a couple slides just on those. Okay, so that was the first five feet. We're moving along. Hit the roads, took care of the structures next, did the five feet. Now we're going to work into the landscape and the next 30 feet. Just real briefly, a call out to California. The zone theory is a, a model of home site protection that's international now. Australia uses it, and, and it was developed in the LA Arboretums in the 1970 after the Bel Air fire was the Bel Air fire that ushered in this new era in California, mega fires, mega destruction, and mega funding. <laughs> this is when the fire engine started to roar after this fire. And the zone theory is this. From 30 feet out from the structure is called zone one. This is defensible space, and it's also called the garden zone. And its primary function is to withstand firebrands and intense heat without igniting. Zone two starts at 31 feet out and goes to 60 to 70 feet out. And its primary job is to stop a fire. So whether that fire is coming in from overhead through trees or on the ground through grass and brush, zone two stops it. And zone three, further out to the property line or to 200 feet, depending on where you live, is zone three, and, and that's the transition zone. And the goal there is to dramatically slow down that fire, change its behavior. So we have a slowing, stopping, enduring are these two, are these three um, zones in the zone theory. I'm just going to focus on the first 30 feet. Time and time again, it is shown that if you have a fire hardened structure and just 30 feet of defensible space, you have more than a 90% chance of survival. Just those two things create a high degree of success during a conflagration. It's a little more complicated than I'm making it sound because zone one, that first 30 feet, actually has to do a lot. It has to be a play area for your kids, it has to provide thermal comfort through umbrellas or shading devices. It has to be beautiful. It has to provide security and privacy. And all these other goals really add a lot of fuels. So let's just focus in on this first 30 feet. Now, defensible space is really hard to define sometimes because it really doesn't have a look. It really depends on where you're working and the needs of the client and how much water they have and whether it's sloped or not. But it does have some care, core characteristics. The pathways are wide and encircle the entire structure. Spaced out 
so it can't leap and the vegetation is well maintained. There's no dead, dying or diseased vegetation. And it's well watered, not overwatered, but well watered and not underwater. We're not stressing out our plants. The materials and landscape are non-flammable. Even the plastics in this bottom picture right here, that chair is made out of nylon, which is PVC. If it fire got right next to it, it would just kind of ooze and bubble and turn into a blob. We're going to use non-flammable materials, good pass, great separation, and even the mulches. I know a lot of agencies are recommending three to four inches of mulch, but really only a half an inch of mulch, as these gardeners have done, just enough to nourish the plant and slow evaporation, but not enough to become a huge risk during a firebrand attack. Shade structures are really important. These are a huge source of liability. In a lot of situations, they attach directly to the homes, which in a lot of locales now is illegal. I know in LA County and LA City, it's illegal now to attach a shade structure to the house because of the danger it poses. The picture to the top left is actually an illegal shade structure. Should have never been attached, but it's common. The problem with our gardens is we have to live in them all year long, we have to be functional for fire for two or three weeks of the year. So it's, sometimes it's really tough to balance these. So if you're going to have a shade structure in your garden, keep it five feet off your house. Tilt it so hot air and firebrands can't get topped, but convection will always lead those firebrands and heat away. You want to use materials that are non-flammable or if you're using wood, make sure it has a one hour fire resistant rating. This is really important. And then plant only the most fire retarding plants around it. And lastly, maintenance is essential on these structures. If you live near the coast, you have to replace them about eight to 10 years. If you live inland, maybe eight to 15 years, but they need replacement. And then tree spacing, I think this is the last defensible space. Tree spacing is essential. Not only is tree spacing great for tree health because it allows air circulation and it reduces the number of pests and problems, but it is it for fire protection in fire country, especially within that first 30 feet. And these guidelines that I'm pictured here were developed after the tunnel fire in 1992 and they're a national standard now. They're well known and all the fire departments use them to evaluate hazards. This is a picture of the Tubbs fire, 2017. If you look at closely at that picture, this is a creep. Those trees, most of the trees are less than 10 years old. Something happened 10 years ago, maybe a change in home ownership, but these trees were allowed to colonize and come right into the defensible space. There's no five feet of clearance. There's no th 30 feet of clearance on this property. And the psychology involved with this creep, this allowing the wild vegetation is a whole nother presentation. And it's really complex and it's not so easy. We can't vilify these people because most of the time they think they're making the right decisions. That's something we need to handle in fire country is how to address these psychological issues and, and keep people regenerating and renewing their landscapes around their homes. We need to be fire. We need to be that force. And then fences are another big, big liability in fire country because people more than anything value their privacy. People love vegetation just so they don't have to see their neighbor. <laughs> and this fence is perfect, made out of the softest, cheapest wood lined <laughs> with Italian cypress that's been pruned, that's been hoarded, tortured. Uh, this is a freeway for fire. So if you have a fence, you're gonna to try to use non-flammable materials. If you've got the money, a cinder block fence would be the way to go. But if you don't, get creative with your materials. You don't have to run wood along the entire length of it. Just use wood where it's needed. There's a lot of strategies we can employ to reduce the overall fuel load on a property. So here's anything here are things that anybody can do, whether you're a renter or homeowner, rich or poor. Remove all flammable items within five feet, especially renters. We're, you know, they're, they're good like that. 
remove the dead, dying, and diseased vegetation. That is the stuff that the firebrands will attack. That is the kindling that allows that fuel, to, that fire to grow on your property, that dead, dying, and diseased. Maintain an inviting driveway. Put a lemonade stand out there. Get those emergency personnel up to your property and house. And then do not let your plants dry out. Santa Rosa did this, you know, in the, in the, uh, you know, when the drought hit in 2014, the Russian river just dried up and they just turned off everything, parkways, mediums, front yards, backyards. And when it hit in 2017, it hit a parched landscape. Listen, if we plant a plant that was irrigation dependent and we turn off the irrigation, we are now obligated to remove the vegetation. So unless you want to remove those vegetation, we, we have to irrigate. And considering that California's landscapes use no more than 2% of the state's developed water supply, I think it's a good investment that we do water. We're not using much. Okay, plants. People love talking about plants. And um, there's about 2,800 2,800 plants available, commercially available to California gardeners. And to put all those plants in a list is just nutty. So it's always better, I've always taught, learn the characteristics, the attributes of a less flammable plant. And then you can go into any nursery and just identify those that are less flammable. So here's the attributes. Broadleaf plants are less flammable than narrow leaf plants or conifers, piece of cake. Moist and easily bent leaves are less flammable, you can just twist them without breaking, are less flammable than brittle leaves. So like kukura, pictured here, the coral bells, you can twist a leaf and it won't break, but if the hop seed and twisted it, you could actually hear the snap. Big difference. Thick leaves are less flammable than thin leaves. Any plant that produces a low amount of litter is going to be less flammable. Sap that looks more like water and not pitch or resinous means that would be uh, the resins would be high flammable. Plants without a fragrance. Fragrance means high in oils and they're more ignitable as a consequence and flammable. And then plants with silver or gray leaves tend to be less flammable because they've pulled up minerals from the soil, deposited them in their leaves to reflect the sunlight back into the atmosphere. And they're just less flammable as a consequence. And then plants without hair, so Fremontia, some of the sick more leaf flammable, slightly more ignitable than um, leaves without hair. Now, working in fire country and designing, I hope we have some um, professional designers here, but I usually work from lists. I love plant lists. And these are some of the plant lists I've used in fire country to a great degree of success. One bird friendly. Um, birds are fantastic to garden for, and there's a lot of um, fire-resistant plants that are bird-friendly. From Clarkia, the birds go crazy over the seeds, elderberry, manzanita, milkweed, redbud, ribage, that's the concurrent, and the gooseberry. Wild rose are all wonderful at attracting and sustaining birds. Food has been saving Californians for hundreds of years. Yeah, but I'm not going to go belabor this one, but food is fantastic at protection, just fantastic. Well-maintained, high moisture, supple leaves. It has all the right characteristics. Medicine, you know, having medicine right outside your door engages you in your landscape in a whole new way. And it's a, a wonderful plant palette to work with. So dandelion, elderberry, whorehound, mint, self heal, yerba mansa are just a couple of the hundreds of beneficial plants we could be having in our urban landscapes. Succulents. Succulents are easy to grow and succulents and cactus and have an impeccable record of success for fire protection. Temperate plants. These are the plants that are used to more alpine cold wintering environments. And um, they are fantastic. Big, broad leaves, supple, non-hairy, not a lot of oils. Uh, so that would be dogwood, hydrangea, maples, service berry, viburnum. All these are really good. And then tropical plants. Boy, if we had the water. <laughs> Tro tropical plants are the absolute best at fire protection. I don't know if you've ever seen fire run up against an avocado or citrus, but they just shrug it off. 
So avocado, banana, citrus, daylily, dracaena, guava, philodendron, taro, even papaya. Um, I grow papaya here. Uh, just wonderful. Just great for fire protection. Uh, natives are the thing though, and there are some native communities that have some wonderful plants for fire protection. So first is the chaparral. Chaparral evolved to a fire cycle from 30 to 60 years. So they're really a long lived, durable, drought um, adapted plant that attracts birds, semi easy to grow. And that would include the California fuchsia, the coffee berry, the, all the mallows actually, not just the island, the, all the oaks, um, the russus, which is lemonade berry and sugar bush and toyon are all wonderful at fire protection and habitat um, enhancement. A riparian plants, which just like a little more moisture, are wonderful. So lobelia, the yellow monkey flower, the miner's lettuce, veronica, that's the swamp for all veronicas actually. Watercress and willow are just wonderful. And then woodland understory. These are the plants that grow under a canopy of trees and they are beautiful. They thrive in urban environments, which we actually have a lot of shade in urban environments. And that would include columbine, ferns, iris, ribes, rose, and viola, the flower of love. But really, <laughs> I'm just going to cut to this chase. After 27 years, every plant I just recommended, I've seen a pile of ash. At the end of the day, plants are stupid. They really are maintenance is going to save you. And this is a great example. Pictured here is Santalina and heavenly bamboo. And Santalina is really considered a fire resistant plant. And this Santalina is anything but fire resistant. And the tragedy here, it's leaning up against the lapwood siding, which has thin windows, which sit tissue paper thin curtains on the other side. These recommended plants, the Nandina and the Sandina, the Santalina, gravely endanger this house. Any plant that is too old, diseased, injured, pest infested, too dry, not healthy, is just flammable as a consequence. Ultimately, at the end of the day, your selection of the plant won't be the thing to save you. Maintenance will. We've seen it a hundred times. And here's just a couple more examples. The picture to the I've been to paradise a couple times since the fire, and it, it, it's just emotionally devastating to go through that area. But what's striking is the amount of junipers everywhere. I mean, there's no town, no houses, no structures, but junipers survived that fire with no problem. And they are the number one plant to vilify. <laughs> <laughs> you just go, you know, you, your mind, you're trying to wrap your mind around all this. And then here's the bonfire. Pictured in front is an oak. Um, in, the, in the background here is an oak that went up and it's on everybody's plant list. And in the foreground is a eucalyptus with still leaves on it <laughs> that had survived. So it's really, really tough to, to be in the vilification business. We really, as experts and, and sympathizers and acknowledgers, we really need to see the condition of the plant and not necessarily just what the plant is. And there's loads of it. Now here's any, here's some things that anybody can do. Even if you're renting, just get out into your garden, remove that dead, dying and diseased vegetation. That is the kindling, that is the liability. I'm going to keep saying it. Replace vegetation before it becomes an economic liability or a fire risk. We need to be fire. We need to be the force of regeneration and renewal. That's our job. If we remove fire from our landscapes, we become fire. That's our role that we need to shoulder. And please do not let your plants dry out, not advocating over water, just water wisely. We need to irrigate if we've planted. Okay, just a quick conclusion. Here we go. Fire is coming. It, <laughs> you know, we can argue till the cows come home what we're going to do in the wilds, whether we're going to graze it, whether we're going to burn it, whether we're going to till it or shave it or whatever we're going to do. 
it won't stop a fire in that landscape. Fire in that landscape is determined by fire weather, and the incidence of that is increasing, and the amount of fine fuels. And we can't get rid of those things from our landscape. It is going to burn. Fire is coming, you guys. No matter what we do in the wilds, fire is coming. And that behooves us just to concentrate on the fundamentals. Let's get this 90% wired before we start working on whatever it was, sweeping and, and or vacuuming the, 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 the federal force or, or whatever. Let's not divert our attention to really what is really going to make a difference in this state. And that is the fundamentals, the roads, the structures, first five feet and those first 30 feet. If we do that in our communities, we will have conquered a major part of the problem in California. And I think in order to do that, this is, you know, I'm on my soapbox here, but I really think we need to ditch the word defensible space. We're not victims. We put our communities in the path of wildfires and then all of a sudden put up our hands and act like the victims. We need to defend against this thing that's attacking us. It's not attacking us. It's just a wild being in a wild landscape. Be an advocate for healthy human habitat. That's what we're creating. We're not creating defensible space. We're creating healthy human habitat. And we're going to focus on the fundamentals and create sanctuaries that provide safety and security, health and well-being for everybody. That's our goal. It's, these landscapes have to work 365 days of the year, not just two weeks. We need sanctuaries from heat. We need sanctuaries from pollutants and, and disruptions and services and goods and and this is what our landscapes, our urban, healthy human habitats can do. Let the fires roam in the wilds where they belong. We can live together. That is my message of end peace. Okay, that was it. That was my presentation. I hope I kept you guys awake. And again, I really appreciate you having me here today. Thank you. And I do. I keep everybody awake. Okay. Yeah, I think we're, yeah. Doug, that was so great. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, I just wanted to step in a little bit here because we're, um, I still want to get to Cheryl's presentation, but we are running a little bit long. Um, so I was going to have Cheryl go, uh, and then we'll have some Q&A um, after Cheryl's presentation. Um, and then the videos that we had planned, um, sorry, Lisa A and Igor, um, but we will send those out in a follow-up email for everybody who signed up, and then you can be able to watch those videos at your leisure. Um, so with that, I will start uh, Cheryl's slides. And Hannah was gonna do a little intro. Oh, sorry. Yeah. That's okay. Let's jump in and do it. You, you can start the slides too while she does the intro. I got it. Awesome. Again, thank you so much, Doug. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Cheryl Miller, and she's speaking to us today from the Diablo Fire Safe Council. Cheryl Miller is the executive director of the Diablo Fire Safe Council, uh, which covers both Alameda and Contra Costa counties. She is a registered landscape architecture and specializes in wildfire related issues. Her area of expertise includes public education, collaborative planning, grant writing, and project management to reduce hazardous conditions. The Diablo Fire Safe Council works with fire departments and communities throughout the East Bay, and they've also developed a number of community wildfire protection plans that cover both county and city scales, including Alameda and Contra Costa County, El Cerrito Kensington, and Sonoma. In her presentation, Cheryl Miller is going to discuss the Diablo Fire Safe Council's Partners in Wildfire Prevention Cost Share Program. Thank you, Cheryl. Sure. Thank you, Hannah. I'm really pleased to follow Doug tonight because he's gotten us all fired up about um, doing things. And I'm here to say, get with your neighbors because together you can do even more. And Diablo Fire Safe Council has a cost share program. So I'm going to give you a quick introduction to the program. I'm going to um, show you eight different projects that your neighbors have done, and we'll talk about where the projects were done, who did them, and what they actually did. And then I'm going to um, 
briefly describe to you the application process. It's very simple. Hannah's going to stick a PDF up in the chat so you can all grab it if you're interested. Um, and then, of course, I'm happy to take uh, questions. So our Diablo Fireside Council has been doing this cost share partner in wildfire prevention program for probably almost 10 years. And our funding goes up and down. Um, we recently had funding from the California Climate Investment Program, and we're looking to partner with the RCDs with some of their funding that they have right now and, and have them learn about how to do this cost share program. So um, even though we don't have any money right now, we have waiting projects. We have some money for those waiting projects. We still encourage you, if you have a project that you and your neighbors want to do, we'd like you to apply. Because sometimes when we get funding in, we only have a couple months to spend it, and we really really want to have um, a great amount of projects to be able to be done because we'd really like to help you all make your houses so that you can live more safely with fire. So Chris, go to the next slide. So um, we're not going to see 22 projects, but I just wanted to show you something about where these projects have happened. So these were projects that we did last year. Um, we had uh, a little over $95,000 in grant funds, and then we had all this amazing community match. That's the share part of cost share that you, you as a group, when you come together to do a project, promise that you'll match the 5,000. And most of our community mem members match it way more than, than what they need to, as you can see by that column of um, numbers of, on the screen. Um, and they match it not only with, with dollars, but also with sweat equity. So sometimes we'll have projects, you'll see them in here for chipping projects, et cetera, where the hours that the volunteers or the homeowners work get counted as quote dollars. And then the, the dollars that we have for the cost share pay a contractor to stretch and do that sort of work that you can't do. Most of us don't wanna work in Poison Oak. Most of us can't or don't own some of the equipment that you'll see in a minute um, to do the project. So last year, the projects happened in Brionis. We're gonna see a Brionis project uh, uh, in a minute. In Castro Valley, in Crockett, in El Sobrante, in Lafayette, Moraga, Oakland, Orinda, and Walnut Creek. And I'm sure that many of you are from these sorts of areas. If you live in a local fire hazard zone or in the very high fire hazard zone as, a, as a designated by CAL FIRE, then you're eligible for these uh, projects. If you're not sure, just I have my contact information at the end. Um, send me an email and I'm happy to um, try to figure it out or we'll come see uh, and see if you and your group would be eligible. So go ahead, Chris, to the next um, slide. So we're going to show you now some wonderful projects. So this was a group that lived on Bear Oaks Lane in Briones, which is out south of Martinez, and they were very concerned about evacuation. They took that idea that that um, Doug talked about, about how important it is to be able to get out of your home. And there were dead trees along their they had a private road that connected all these homes together and they um, took the funds and hired a tree crew that did the stuff that they couldn't do. They cleared the lower areas. They piled stuff for chipping, but then they used our $5,000 to hire. So they chose a contractor. That's the other piece that you do when you do one of these projects. You and the neighbors come together, put in an application. One of you works as a project coordinator. Uh, and, and hire the contractor you want to work with. We have many um, names we can recommend, but, but we really want you to be happy with who. And then when the work's done, the contractor sends us the bill. So this is the first one. It's in Bear Oaks Lane in Briones. So out in the um, state responsibility area for those of you who understand that language. So go ahead and go to the next one. Chris, if you can advance. But we also work in the more urban areas. So this is in um, Oakland. It's in Hiller Highlands, right near where the 1991 tunnel fire happened. Um, this is a very active community member that loves to organize projects and get all sorts of volunteers groups to work. So their project on um, this particular time, we've worked with them before, but on this four and a half acres was to get over 233 volunteers and they were pulling broom. Um, you can see the dumpsters. They got dumpsters that were um, uh, donated. And um, those, of course, end up to green waste. But there also was work on the project of working in Poison Oak and working in some tree trimming that the volunteers couldn't do. So this was a mix of um, volunteer effort and um, contractor effort. It was really done. It's a, it was a labor of love to start pulling these volunteers together. So if you have a place that you love, um, and that you can get permission to work on. Part of this was private property, part of this was city 
part of it was Caltrans property and the volunteer was able to um, actually get Caltrans to do some work too uh, because we, they got a lot of good press about this. So that's uh, a very much more urban area in Oakland. So next slide. This one might be a little more relatable. It was um, five homes that have properties that all come together. It's up in El Sobrante on Live Oak Circle in Monteverde. And they had this idea and probably started with just one neighbor of saying, what if we brought in goats? They really wanted to bring in goats to deal with uh, some of the poison oak and the blackberry and the thickets that were below their homes um, in the shared, well, it was all private yards, but nobody had fenced yards. They were all just yards that they were all concerned about a fire that might come into this little piece of the canyon. So um, they reached out, got an application made and they um, arranged to bring in goats. So most of their cost, share, cost match was actually cash to be able to get uh, more days of the goats in on the project. So goats are a possibility. It doesn't have to just be hand crews, it could be goats. So next, um, the next is in uh, just to the southeast of Lafayette. It's uh, an area called Hunsinger Canyon. And all of these homes happen to be members of a road association. So it was pretty easy. Well, it's never easy, but um, there was a ready-made way to start communicating with all the members. They, you'll notice this cost share was 20,000 and that's because they divided their neighborhood into several sections. Um, it's a fairly long road and um, they were protecting 21 homes. So they were able to divide themselves into sections and do multiple applications. And they did a mix of um, homeowners cutting materials. So again, do the things you can do. And then of course, you have to think ahead about what are you gonna do with all that debris that you cut because there's nothing worse that could all become a, a fire hazard. But in this case, they knew uh, that they were gonna get the funds. They had cut materials, they laid it out. They hired a contractor to do chipping crews. And then the same contractor also did some tree work. So that's uh, uh, parcels that are a little bit larger maybe than a standard suburban parcel. Some of them were an acre or two, and some of them were smaller, less than an acre size parcel. So that's the Hunsinger Canyon Road Association in Lafayette. So on to the next one, Chris. This is another one that's maybe a little unusual, except it was a very creative that this was a homeowner association that was very concerned about the property over the fences. They were, they'd been pushing and doing work in their subdivision, but they were very concerned about the brush uh, buildup that was happening over their fences. They uh, talked with a property owner and collectively they managed to um, develop this project, get the grant funds and the um, bring in a piece of machinery, which is called a masticator that could selectively cut brush and um, with its head work around the, the plant materials and the trees. And there were shrub islands that were left. This was a really um, uh, exciting project. It treated 15 acres for what was our cost share piece. So we recognize this is not always going to happen. But if you have a big project that you need to have um, equipment on, that can our cost share program can pay for that too. All right, on to the next one. We only have a few more left. We have three left. Uh, this was another labor of love where they, the coordinator was working with the police action league camp. So they were working on a public space that they got permission to um, continue to do work. They had volunteers that pulled broom and they had a contractor that did tree thinning to help really um, protect this cluster of cabins that is a summer camp for the kids in from, from downtown Oakland as part of the police action league. On to the next. We do work with tree thinning. This is a, a property owner and the neighbors that uh, were really concerned about this one property's um, eucalyptus trees and they did a thinning project. Go ahead and to the last one. And then we're very aware of the fact that parts of the East Bay are seeing a lot of dieback. Um, some of our community members helped point out the dieback that's been happening. And we were very fortunate recently just to have some dollars that were very specific to evacuation support. And we were able to spend them in um, an area in Montclair right before you get on the highway to remove some of the dying um, acacia primarily that could fall now that they're dead and dying, that could fall and, and block all of our evacuation routes. So I hope you'll see, go ahead to the next one. Hope you'll see that we have a really wide variety of um, projects that we would love to support. I'd love to support even more. Um, and we encourage you, our application is a very simple two-page application. If you have any questions as you start to fill it out, um, 
just give me an email or give me a call and I'll talk it through. The, the most important criteria is it needs to be at least five um, members that are agreeing to work together because the idea is to leverage what you can do with what your neighbors can do to what we can help you do to really get um, more, especially for those of us who live on small lots, to get more collective fire safety um, on the landscape. There are some questions about what do you what do you plan to do and questions about how will you contribute, um, but it's meant to be a very simple application. So we really want to encourage you and go ahead to the last slide um, to apply. And if you have any questions, please um, give me an email or a call. Or if you just remember nothing besides Diablo Fire Safe Council, you go to our website, you can see um, my contact information there too. So that's my presentation. And uh, I think now we're, we can open it up for questions. So Chris, do you wanna facilitate and ask us some questions and then Doug and I'll take a stab at answering? I think um, Hannah's gonna take that piece. Okay, perfect. Yeah, thank you, Cyril, so much. It was a great presentation. Great to learn about all the projects that are going on in the communities. Um, so our first question is, how much value is in fire resistance fighting, for example, ceramic paint, stucco, um, hardy board versus wood siding? So Doug, is that something you want to take? Or Chris, can I, if, um, if Cheryl Drinkwater is still in the audience, can we actually have her? Take this, she's an architect who deals with, with structure hardening. She's one of the Diablo Fire Safe Council board members. Cheryl, are you- Yeah, I can willing? promote her. Yeah, that's If a you're okay thing. with that, Cheryl. Sure, we can uh, ask the next question um, in the meantime. So if we live on a hill, do we need sprinklers and fence? Not necessarily. <clears throat> I'll take that question if you don't mind. The first 30 feet for sure. Yeah, you want to make sure that that's moist. But you don't, you know, if you've planted, um, right, you don't, it, it's not mandatory that you have sprinklers down there. It's a good idea. And especially at the height of summer to give your chaparral or your scrub plants um, irrigation, um, you know, once a month, a real deep, deep water. Um, and if that facilitates the irrigation system, then heck yeah. But as an emergency source, um, sometimes it's a little dubious. You really want to talk to your local water provider to find out um, if it's really appropriate to turn on the irrigation and then just leave and evacuate and have that water in your property. Because sometimes that can result in a net loss of pressure in the, in the, in the water pipes. And um, so I think that's a, we really need to see the site. That was a good question. That was a super and, question. And uh, I'll jump in because being yeah. from the area, I almost always say um, that thinking of putting a sprinkler water on a fire during our hard winds is really just a waste of water. Leave yeah. it to the professionals. Don't go up on your roof, God forbid, don't go up on your roof where you can slip and fall and be another sort of accident just when it's really difficult to get people there. Um, that thinking that you're gonna be able to put it out with water um, during our high wind events, which is when our fire is the most concern, I'd rather see you use something different in your fence. Um, you know, Doug offered us a couple of suggestions about, uh, he showed us wire in the fences and, and rather than having a wood fence and thinking of irrigating it, switch to a different type of fence material. Awesome, it looks like- Cheryl... Yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so it looks like Cheryl's with us now. Um, Cheryl, do you want to, if you can, answer that question about how much value is in fire resistance siding versus wood siding? I'm sorry. Hi, my name is Cheryl. Could you repeat the question? Yeah, so the question is how much value is in fire resistance siding? So ceramic paint, stucco, hardy board versus wood siding? Well, as Douglas said, um, maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. Hmm. So, um, so I'm an architect in Berkeley. I do almost 100% residential projects, work up in Berkeley's fire zone too quite often. And there are products out there now like Hardy Plank. There's also Boral uh, that are considered non-flammable sidings. And really what it has to do with is the whole assembly. So it's not just the siding, it's the, the, you know, the whole assembly, whether that is siding and then sheetrock, 
or a dens glass, which is like a fireproof um, sheetrock. And then you have plywood. So there's that assembly. And then there's also sheetrock on the interior. But those products do have some non-flammable qualities and will help to kind of repel, if you will, the embers. But again, it all has to do with maintenance. So if you have any gaps, say around windows or window trim or at the bottom of the siding where mm -hmm. embers can get in or say they're collecting on a deck and then they enter at the bottom of the siding if it's exposed um, and you don't have say a concrete curb there, a foundation there, or uh, like I said, again, about the windows. And then as you go up the wall, um, you have your overhang. And if your eave is open and there are vents there to ventilate your roof, it just kind of is a, you know, a systemic problem. And so it's really about maintenance even more than the material. If you have some beautiful old siding on your house that you know, is from just 50, 70 years ago and it's well-maintained, then you do not need to go ripping that off to protect okay. your home. You have many, many other things you can do first. And, and um, in all the years that I worked with Steve Quarles, who many of you know from the Institute of Building and Home Safety, they sort of have a, a list of what's the highest priority. So your siding is not your highest priority. Start with your roof. If your roof is perfect, then you might think about, you know, boxing your eaves and all, all your vents should be thought of up in one of the first things. Your siding is kind of getting down there where if you've done everything else, then as Cheryl says, you might start to look at your siding. But look at your deck before you look at your siding. Look at your vents before you look at your siding. Look at your eaves. Look at your roof. Um, look at your objects on your property. Yeah. All those are potential fuels. Again, as Douglas talked about umbrellas, you know, I see people leave their umbrellas out all year round. Um, you really have to become like a weather expert. You want to watch the weather. And that means the rain, the sun, the wind, fire weather. You need to just be really aware and prepare for a possible inundation, um, you know, especially if it's a high fire, high fire severity weather. Thanks, Cheryl, for being willing. Yeah, to sure. In. That was kind yeah, of yeah, a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> well, Cheryl has done a really good um, webinar with the Oakland Fire Safe Council about home hardening. And if you haven't seen that, if you go to the Oakland um, Fire Safe Council or email them, I'm sure they can get you the link to that home hardening uh, webinar that, that Cheryl did. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Yes, it's great to have you as an impromptu uh, panelist. Yeah. Well, it's um, also great to be here. I know Chris from another hat and uh, that I wear, and so it was great uh, to see him as the one of the hosts. Yeah, thanks, Cheryl. All right. If we, I do want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, we have a couple more questions. Um, let's see. One is how much risk is presented by Arundo growth on a creek? I hate Arundo. <laughs> A lot of risk. Doug, do you have an opinion on a rundo? It's got all the characteristics to carry fire. It, it, it is a less flammable plant, but it's a, it's an urban plant. It's souping up our pollutants. It's one of the best plants for pollutant removal. Um, so it's really an indicator of a polluted stream and um, it's normally an urban stream. So it's more of a, an effect than a cause. It's highly flammable when it dries out. It's got all the worst characteristics, but from a <clears throat> groundwater supply point of view, it's actually kind of beneficial because it pulls out the heavy metals and transforms the toxins. So oh, I didn't know that. So there's a benefit to it. They, never, there's I a benefit to every was. plant. Every <laughs> every plant is a gift from uh, our mother. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thank you. And our last question um, is: How do we determine our real fire risk? So, if someone lives on flat land near the bottom of a hill, rather than the top, surrounded by landscape yards, um, they're saying that their recent firestorm indicates that they can still be burned with high winds during the fire. In general, our neighborhood does not feel like it should be great fire risk, but insurance agencies have rated them as high fire zones. I think after Coffee Park, we've really changed some of our thinking about these wind-driven fires up here in the north, um, in the north area. That um, you know, we've shown how far fire can be blown in to our neighborhoods. You know, Coffee Park's flat; it's just homes. If you look at what's left after the burn. It was all house to house um, uh, can conflagration 
a lot of the trees and the landscape wasn't even touched. And so that may be what's happening right now. Um, we are in a, in a place with our insurance companies that, you know, they're, they're, we all are just looking in the crystal ball trying to figure out where will fire happen next. Um, we're showing that fire comes further into the community than we ever thought. And uh, a lot of times it's really hard to fight against the insurance company too. If, if they don't want to insure your area, you may have to go to the, um, to the state pools to be able to get insurance. I'm sorry, I don't have a happier answer. <laughs> I wish I did, but I think yeah. the reality is is that we're in a, a new regime of wind-driven fires that's coming further and further. And a lot of our homes just were not built to withstand, um, especially if I'm here in the East Bay, a lot of our homes are so close together and Doug talked about how house to house really happens. And that's what's carrying our fires further and further into our communities. That was a super answer. <laughs> I've answered it many times and I'm always sad to answer <laughs> that it. That was really good, yeah. After Coffee Park, I'm really sad to answer it. Yeah. Okay, well, I think that's all the questions we had in the Q&A and I didn't see necessarily any hands raised uh, in our attendees. Um, so just to be respectful of folks' time, thank you for going over with us. Uh, Douglas and Cheryl, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, the wealth of knowledge was so great, and I hope all the attendees uh, got a lot out of it. And hopefully, uh, keep an eye out for your emails tomorrow. We will send up some follow-up resources along with some links to the videos. Um, so thanks again, everybody who joined us. Hopefully, you can join us for other sessions during our Earth Week. Um, but if not, have a happy Earth Week, and hopefully a happy Earth Month, and even beyond. So thank you. <laughs>